we believe very strongly in Jewish continuity. But one of the things we note there on the outline in front of you is often in these studies and in these action plans on what will we do to stem the tide of assimilation? What will we do to have more Jewish young people identify as sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? The thing that's almost always missing from the study results and from the action plan is what I feel is really the key to understanding Jewish continuity. And that is the fact that God has a continuing relationship with the Jewish people. You see, if it was just dependent upon putting together good plans and crafty plans and, and putting more money into it and sending our, our teens and our young adults off to Israel for a few months, uh, if it was just that, I'd be concerned because those things aren't always successful. A lot of young people come back and they still sense an emptiness. You know, the, the old rabbinim, the old rabbis, they would uh, talk about something called the Pintle Yid. And if you know any Yiddish, the Pintle Yid is that, that little God-shaped void inside each one of us that cries out for a connection with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. People attempt to fill that pintle yid, that old that void, with all kinds of things. Uh, there are many people who attempt to fill it with success in this world, recognition or, or money. Uh, they imagine that somehow these other pursuits will fill a void that really is a spiritual void. And so at the ends of these programs and when societies are tidying up and then and seeing what these programs have resulted in, oftentimes it's, a, as we say in Hebrew, it's chetzi chetzi. It's half and half. Oh, well, you know, some of the kids are following the path and some of the kids are not. I would submit to you that the missing ingredient, once again, is the fact that if we leave the God of Israel out of Israel's future, there is no future for Israel. God himself has promised a future for our Jewish people. And so it is imperative that we recognize that and that we bring God into that equation. And so, uh, directing your attention to the uh, outline in front of you, I'm going to suggest we do a little excursion there uh, through the scriptures, through the Jewish Bible, and see literally how the scriptures outline this very important subject. One of the things that, unfortunately, is little known outside of the most orthodox circles is the fact that God orders his relationship with people based on his covenant promises. Throughout the scriptures, throughout the Torah, you will see the fact that God makes covenant agreements. A covenant agreement is simply a fancy way of saying some sort of negotiated deal, or even a non-negotiated deal. Uh, a covenant can be conditional. In other words, it's conditioned on both sides, keeping their end of the bargain. Or it might be unconditional, where one party is powerful enough to say to a weaker party, this is the way it's going to be. Throughout the scripture, we can count at least eight covenants that God makes with mankind in general. Some of those are made specifically with the Jewish people. I would submit to you that the most important of the covenant sacred agreements that God made with our Jewish people is the Abrahamic covenant. And we first found it in the very book that Matthew read from this morning, the book of Bereshit. In that book of Genesis, God calls a man named Avram, and he calls him out of a pagan background. Avram didn't know anything but paganism. There's an old Midrash, an old story that the rabbis tell, and they uh, talk about the origins of Abraham and how his father was an idol maker. And in the city that they lived, in the Ur of the Chaldees, uh, idols were very popular. And a person who could carve a very beautiful idol to, for people to bow down to would become very rich. And so the Midrash uh, from the rabbi says that one day when Avram, when Abraham was just a teenager, he had to help his father go into 
and, and help and sell these idols. So one day, as the story goes with a little modern embellishment, uh, Abram's father goes off into the forest and he needs to cut down some more logs, some more trees to, to get logs to carve into idols. So he says to Abraham, here, you mind the store. You know, it said, you know, uh, the idol makers uh, uh, to, the, to the prince, all that sort of thing over the store. He said to Abraham, you mind the store. I need to go out to the forest, cut down some trees, and uh, you sell idols here. And as it was, it turned out to be a slow day. And Abram is looking at all of these idols. He's you know, kind of a teenager and, and feeling a sort of righteous indignation as he looks around at all these idols. And he says to himself, I see my father go into the forest, cut down a tree, cut it in half. Half of the tree he fashions into a beautiful idol that people bow down to and give lots of devotion to. But the scrawnier part of the tree, I see him tossing it into the fire to warm ourselves and to, to cook. How foolish this. People are bowing down to one half of the wood while we throw the other half in the fire. And in the moment of you know, teenage uh, righteousness, of wanting to right all the wrongs in the world, the rabbis in the Midrash say that Abram took an, an ax and started chopping up all these beautiful idols in his father's idol store. Except for the largest idol, the Baal idol, which had hands outstretched. And he took the ax and he laid it across the arms of this outstretched idol. And he waited for his father to come back to the store. So his father comes back to the store and his father says, Oh, you give up. What happened here? How did this happen? What happened in the store? So Abe says, Oh, you see that big idol over there? He got into an argument with all the other idols. You wouldn't believe the mess. There were fists flying and uh, there was a whole dust up. And at the end of all the, the bloom and the bam and all this sort of thing, he was the last idol left standing. Okay? He was the only one. And so, Abram's father looks at his son, his jaw drops, and then he finally says, idols can't argue, they can't talk, they can't fight, they can't think. So Abram takes a long pause, looks at his father and says, so Pop, why are we bowing down to them? Right. Now, if you go looking for that story in the Torah, it's not there. <laughs> it's in the Midrashim which are extra biblical writings from the Rebbe. But it illustrates the sense that Abram had to find and to follow the one true God. And so the scriptures say that God saw that in Abram. You know, when God sees in you a desire, he finds a way to, to communicate with you. He finds some way to get in your face and to tell you what you need to know. That's what God did with Abram. God appeared to Abram one day and said, I'm going to call you to do a special work for me. And from the pages of the Torah, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and following, this is the covenant that ultimately our Jewish survival depends upon. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. One of the things we see there is that Abram had to leave his comfort zone, which was idolatry, and had to follow after the one true God. Verse 2, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. For through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Let's work backwards for a minute. All the families of the earth desperately needed the blessing of God. Because all the families of the earth, both Jew and Gentile alike, were caught in a cycle of sin and death and sin and death. That was not the original plan of Hashem. If we go back in Torah, we see that the plan of Hashem, the plan of God, was that people would live eternally. That seems like such a, a Meshuggah idea to you and I today, because we regularly see people in pain and dying. 
It's a phenomenon in our human life. We come up, we do all right for a while, and in the end, invariably, we know what the end is. So it seems as though that seems to be the, the natural thing. But if you go back into the earliest pages of the Torah, we understand that God, God doesn't create death. He doesn't create evil, hara, but rather he did all things well. He, he saw that it was good. Pain and death and suffering were brought in at man's instigation because Adam the Chava, Adam and Eve, because they sinned and brought upon themselves and all their descendants the penalty for that sin, which is lost in this cycle of sin and death and sin and death. It was not God's desire, but it was something that we fell into. So, in seeing this, it was not, the Lord wasn't willing that this should go on indefinitely. All the families of the earth needed to be blessed. How? There's a little intimation, a little hint about it. A few chapters earlier in Genesis, where it says that sin can be paid for. It can be covered over for a time by a sacrifice. Because the principle of scripture is that sin leads to death. Sin leads, that's what it says very clearly, several pages in the Hebrew scriptures. Sin leads to death. If not your death, how about if I provide a substitute? Someone, something, someone else. Other blood to be shed. And that principle is first seen in the earliest pages of the Rashid, where God slew an animal to provide covering for Adam and Eve. And so there's a little inkling here that the way in which God is going to bless all the families of the earth is to bring through Abraham the one who would be the atonement. He also promises to Abraham in verse 3 something that's very important. He says in verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. Why is it that every world power, the biggest bullies in the universe, would come after the Jewish people. And you can go and read the epitaph of those world superpowers of Egypt who tried to destroy all the Jewish people, who tried to drown all the, the male Jewish children, but they had their own sons, their own army drowned of Assyria, of Babylon, of Medio Persia. These are sometimes names that are obscure to us, but they were the major world power. Every single one of them took their shot at trying to destroy our people. This passage of scripture anticipates that that's going to happen because Hasatan, the one that is called in the Jewish Bible Satan, does not want to see the plan of God go forward. And so he raises up pagan nations like Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medes and Persians to try to destroy the Jewish people either physically or cut off their belief in the one true God. He raised up Greece, very attractive to the eye, but it was designed to draw our Jewish people away from the worship of Hashem to the worship of pagan idols. Every single one of these world powers rose, and as they began to persecute the Jewish people, they fell. God keeps his promise, and it's first seen here in the Abrahamic covenant. So I submit to you that the Abrahamic covenant is really the governing mechanism of Jewish continuity. Jewish survival ultimately doesn't depend upon what we do, it depends upon God's promise. It's an unconditional promise. It's not conditioned on any obedience on our part. Because if it was, oy, 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 we would be in trouble. It is an unconditional covenant. And one that we've seen worked out through time. Yes, we've taken our lumps more than deserved. But in the end, when everyone was writing our obituary, when people assumed that there would not be a Jewish people in two generations, the Jewish people have risen back up. And again, it's based on God's promise here.